scripture reading is taken from the letter to the Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 15 to 23. And I invite you to rise as we read God's word. Therefore, I also, after I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what, the, what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet to give him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Please be seated. Well, good morning. <clears throat> I, yes, yeah, Sabbath blessings to everybody here. <clears throat> I want to talk to you. We're going to continue on in this series on Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and there is a lot in this book that applies to us today, to our world in which you and I live in. I've gone over that in the sermon preview for the series, and I just want to encourage you to read through Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. And so just want to uh, also welcome our online audience here. Uh, if you're watching us, you're watching us at MiddletownPortlandSDA.org. And then there's also, if you want to hear messages like this or other additional material, you can find them on that website, as well as my personal YouTube channel called Path of Prophecy. I'm producing videos, addressing current issues, trying to address that, as well as feed the dog and wash the dishes and all these other fun things. But anyways, you get the idea. But I want to speak right now to our online audience. We love having you participate, and we're very encouraged. We go back and check. I check from time to time to see how many views we're getting, and we're so encouraged by the numbers that we're seeing. And we also want to invite you to participate more fully in our worship by uh, going to our website. If you want to help us out financially, our church does uh, need financial assistance because we run a food pantry and we help others in the community and we're very active in that. And so uh, we also, with winter coming on, we have to pay the bills and heat the place up and whatnot. And we're trying to be good stewards. Uh, we don't always heat the place up during the middle of the week. We Sometimes we meet electronically uh, for our prayer meetings. But nonetheless, we want to make that appeal and allow you to partner with us because we're doing great things and we want to do greater things in the Middletown Portland area. So we're just want to inviting you to participate more fully in the worship experience through the responsive use of your tithes and your offerings. So having said that, I want to offer a word of prayer here and let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It's my prayer that our faith would be strengthened by what is shared today and we thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is December 17th, and that means that tomorrow is December 18th. Well, it goes a little bit further than that. It's that time of year where we think about the birth of Jesus Christ. Amen? And there is nothing wrong with that at all. We should never apologize for reflecting on the birth of our Lord and Savior. But what I want to do is continue on in this series. We're in chapter one, we're wrapping up chapter one. Next time we meet, chapter two, but actually next week we'll take a little break. I told you I would take breaks from time to time. And I think very next week I'll be here at the Middletown Portland Church and I think it would be very appropriate to preach a message about the birth of Christ on Christmas Eve, what we call Christmas Eve. So we'll take a little bit of a break 
But that gives you all the more time to bone up on Ephesians chapter 2, because that's where we're going next. Amen? But make no mistake, that book, the Paul's letter to the Ephesians, is relevant to us today. It has a lot to say to us. A lot of us may want to hear about this or about that, but for right now, folks, we're going to go through Ephesians, and we just need to go through it. Take some of those chapters and try to memorize them. Take time to just really delve into it. So we want to go into uh, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Fred read to us the scripture reading just a few moments ago, and here's what it says. Ephesians chapter 1, turn in your Bibles there. I love to hear those pages turning, folks. I love to hear those pages turning. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, Paul says, Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer. So here's something very interesting. What Paul is telling us is that he's praying for the church at Ephesus. Amen? And that's something that we can take a lesson from, is to pray, to pray for our church. And I know that we do, okay? And we want to invite our online audience to pray for us, pray for this ministry. We're doing uh, fantastic things. We're reaching people who have come here to America from all over the world. So actually, with our little food pantry ministry, we're reaching the world, okay? Because there's a lot of people from all over the world who've come here. And so uh, we just wanted to make mention of that. So we pray for our church, and the Apostle Paul was no different. He prayed for the church at Ephesus. Now, wouldn't it be nice to know what he prayed? Wouldn't that be interesting? Well, you know what? If we read our Bibles, we can actually know what he prayed. So let's read our Bibles. Here's what it says, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now that's a mouthful. That's a lot. But essentially, if we were to boil it down, <clears throat> what Paul is trying to say, and I'm just going to use my own words. You can use your words. You can go back over this. But let's just try to flesh this out. What he's trying to do is he's telling the church at Ephesus, I'm praying for you, and I'm praying that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You see, folks, what Paul wants the church at Ephesus to know is he wants the church to know Jesus. He wants the church to be anchored, anchored in Jesus. You know, my mom shared a story with me. She might be watching right now. Just to let you know, Mom, I'm reading the stuff that you sent. She sent me a story uh, to the family, actually, about these two men who went sailing. Uh, they were from, I think, New Jersey, and the one guy, he only had boating experience with motorboats, but a friend of his had a sailboat. And they went on a sailboat, and the plan, plan was to go to Florida, somewhere in Florida. I can't remember what town, but they wanted to f sail along the coast of the eastern United States and head down to Florida. They told their children, this is what we're planning to do, and okay, fine. And every night they would call in and say, this is where we're at, this is our geographical location, and such and such and such and such. But then the signal went silent for 10 days. And the family didn't know what to do. And the Coast Guard went looking. And the Navy got involved and went looking. And all kinds of ships out there were looking for this sailboat that was out on the Atlantic, the stormy Atlantic. Just, this just happened just days ago, just weeks ago. Looking for these men, these two men that went sailing with their dog. I think they had a dog with them. And they were fearful that they had gotten shipwrecked somewhere or even worse, 
that they got so far out to sea that they got into the Gulf Stream, and the Gulf Stream, once you get into that Gulf Stream, you can't really sail through that. That Gulf Stream just takes you north into the uh, North Atlantic, and then you freeze to death. Okay? And they were in this little teacup of a sea boat. But the man said that he had prayed and committed his life to the Lord. And there was a freighter that was passing by. And they happened to see these men on a boat waving their shirts and trying to flag down this freighter ship. And the freighter finally came alongside of them and took them on board. They had been discovered after 10 days being lost at sea. Okay. They were without an anchor. They were drifting. They were, their sail, uh, the sails had come down in a storm and the waves had been so big that they had frightened them. They were without any hope. And what Paul is telling the church here at Ephesus is I want, I'm praying for you that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him and that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened so that you would know whom you believe. Amen? It is so important that we know whom we believe because the world is offering all kinds of alternatives. You can believe in this. You can believe in that. You can believe in this. Or you can believe in that. Or you don't have to believe in it all. And you'll all get there just the same. Right? Isn't that what the world says? It's what the world promises. You can believe what you want. I'll believe what I want. And we'll still meet up in the same place. God's Word sheds a whole different light on the circumstances of life that you and I are in. And it's Paul's prayer to the church at Ephesus, and it ought to be our prayer, that we ask God to give us the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, and that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. Now, why is this important? It's because God wants to teach us something. What does he want to teach us? Well, our text tells us that there are three things that God wants us to know. Three things. How many things? Three things. Not five, not seven, not two, but three things. We're going to keep it simple. We're just going to keep it to three things. What are these three things? Let's go. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Number one, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Not that you may think about what the hope of His calling is. Not that you may wonder what is the hope of His calling, but that you may know. There's a difference between wondering and knowing. Right? One is kind of philosophical. I think about it. Sometimes I wonder. It could be. It may happen. I don't know. Kind of vague. But when we know something, what? I woke up this morning, it was snowing. But I looked at the weather report, and you know what it said? It said the sun was going to be shining today. So you know what? I didn't take a raincoat. I didn't take an umbrella. Why? Because I knew that the sun is coming out. And guess what, folks? Take a look out your windows. Is it snowing, or is the sun out? The sun is out. That's right. Because the weatherman got it right today. And because of that, we were able to know what's going on. God wants us to know the hope of His calling. God has put a calling on your life. Are you aware of that? Every one of us in this room and those who are watching, God has put a calling on our lives. It's an amazing little church here at Middletown, Portland. I brag to everybody what an amazing group this is and how we have amazing youth department with little Rika nine years old, playing the piano, week in and week out. That's right. I finally got her attention over here. Week in and week out, she plays the piano, right? Yeah? Okay. The point being is that she knows what her calling is. Okay? 
She has the gift of music. She's developing the gift of music. Her parents are investing in that gift. And that gift is bearing fruit, right? She's able to lead out in the music, you know, in, in her, uh, what, what limitations she has right now, but she's doing the best she can. But God has placed a calling on her life, and she's responding to that call. Okay? The church, from what I understand, the history, I've been here just a little over a year, and talking to Phil, talking to uh, Pat, talking to others, learning about your history, how you were wondering, should we close down the church or not? We're such a little group. For those of us online, you might be able to look through the camera lens and see. I don't know if it's just focused on me or if it goes a little broader than that. You can see some of the pews are empty. I make no apologies about that. Okay? That's just what, the way it is. But I know that this church has prayed. How do I know that? Because they told me. They told me their story. And they said, Lord, do you want us to close down or not? What is the answer for that? And the Lord, through providential leading, indicated to them, no, you are not to close down. You are to remain open. There's a purpose I have for you. There is a calling that I have for you. Do you know that that calling was responded to this week? I was sharing with others during Sabbath school time that we had some literature in our literature table this week and three individuals picked up our literature without being cajoled or arm twisted or anything like that. They saw the literature laying there and they just picked it up freely. There is a purpose, a calling that you have for here. Now we've got to explore this a little bit further. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 30, let's figure this out. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Okay? Now that's kind of like in a little bit of a sequential order. But it expands on this idea what it doesn't mean, this idea of predestination, let's get this out on the table right now. It doesn't mean that those over here are predestined to be saved and those over here are predestined to be lost. That's not how it works. It simply means that God had a plan in place that He set and He made it available. He is making this plan of salvation available to everybody. But it's up to us to respond to His calling. Now, some people don't respond to His calling. Okay? The appeal goes out. The appeal goes out. And the appeals continually go out and people reject it. Reject it. And reject it. Okay? But God has a calling on each one of our lives. But when we respond to that calling, what does God do for us? He justifies us. Amen? When we turn to God, when God calls us and we turn to Him, he justifies us. By accepting what Christ has done for us, He justifies us freely, the Bible says. And what does He do then for us? The Bible promises that He will glorify us. Amen? He will glorify us. Okay? Curtis, your sister, is preparing to go to her rest. She may not even be aware of her circumstances. I, I had the privilege of meeting her you know, those few times, once or twice that I was over there, okay? But her condition speaks that she may not totally be aware of everything, I don't know. Medical science could tell us otherwise. But the point is, is that God has a calling for each one of us. He will justify us. And when we go to our rest, He gives us the hope that He will glorify us. That we're not going to remain in these bodies forever. Okay, that if we go to the grave, that we have the hope of the resurrection. And that's what this idea is, the hope of His calling. Now let's listen here, Second Peter. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I put this verse in here simply to explain that idea of, some people have it in their heads that, well, we're predestined. This group over here is predestined to be saved. This group over here is predestined to be lost. But Peter speaks otherwise to that idea of you don't really have a choice in the matter. Listen to this. He's, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Just the idea of coming to repentance to God is indicative that we have a choice. We have to have a choice in that matter. 
Okay, we're not robots. We're not just little uh, automatons that God winds up and tells us exactly what to do. We have a choice in the matter. God wants us to repent, but we may not all choose to repent. Okay, but He is waiting for us to repent. He's calling us to repent. He's wooing us to repent. His goodness is being revealed to us so that we would consider and ponder the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God. So, He predestines, He calls, He justifies, He glorifies. But this is to inform us that there is a hope in our calling. That's the first thing that Paul wants us to know, the hope of his calling. I said I was going to tell you three things that the church needs to know. So that means we've got two more things to go by, right? Here's the second one. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Now, friends, some folks look at this two different ways. And it's, it's fair enough. But let's take a look at how this can be conceived or perceived. One way is to look at that we ourselves are God's inheritance. Okay? Christ came to purchase us. We're not with him yet, but one day, and hopefully one day soon, we're going to all be with him together. Amen? And here's what the Bible says. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. All of us, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in God's sight. And we are all children of God. Amen? All of us. So we are God's inheritance. We, he gathers us in. Okay? But there's another way of looking at it, and really both are equally the same, and we ought to think of, of really of both of them. That's why I'm giving you both of them. It's not an either-or. But really, they, they fit in together quite well. But listen to this. Revelation chapter 21, verse 10, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. I have the privilege of studying with Valerio. Valerio is a, a, an individual who comes and visits the Three Angels Church, our sister church not far from here. And he approached me several months ago and says, Pastor, it's time that I get baptized. I said, oh, really? He said, yes. I said, well, what's your faith background? He says, well, my wife is an Adventist, and uh, I, I live with an Adventist, and my in-laws are Adventists, and I've come to know the message, but I want to get baptized. I want to make the decision. Praise God. So we started studying. And we just finished lesson, I can't remember exactly what number it was, but we've been talking about uh, eternal life and what God promises us. And we had been reading for several weeks, because our lesson is only so much time, and it was quite a lengthy lesson. But we have been reading about the New Jerusalem. And just, he was amazed. You could hear him on the phone over the, the, the internet, over the uh, Zoom call that we do. And he's just amazed by all this. Because the, the Bible comments that we're reading that go along with the lesson talk about the size of the great city. Okay. And I did a little measurement with my little uh, GPS system. And the New Jerusalem, if you work it out in our measurements and miles, it's about from here down to Washington, D.C. That's the city, and it's square. Now, I've driven through New York City. I've gone through New York City on the way to see my in-laws as we live down in New Jersey. I've been in the city. Uh, in the Bronx, and uh, through Brooklyn and Manhattan, and it's a big city, right? Anybody ever been to New York City? It's a big city, okay? Just building after building after building. And poor little Hartford, you drive next to Hartford, you drive on 84. <laughs> Nothing. 
compared to New York City. Doesn't even compare, right, MJ? Not even compare. But this city, the New Jerusalem, the way the scholars have measured it out, say if this is, you know, it's beyond our the pale that a city could be this large, four square, the length of it essentially from a distance from Connecticut all the way to Washington, D.C. Can you imagine a city that big? And then, you know, the length and the depth and the breadth and the height and all that. Commentary was saying that there's enough for 32 billion people to live there. So there's room for everybody. That's the point. There's room. We are to know the hope of our calling, and we are to know the glorious riches of what God has. Okay? But I'll go even further. It's more than just this material that we get at the end, this, you know, the city, the city, the New Jerusalem, mansions of gold, all, you know, all this kind of talk. But what about the God's great richness of God's grace. Amen? And we look at our own lives and see how we measure up. And we recognize how, fall, how far we fall short of the glory of God. But it's through God's glorious riches that He's bestowed upon us. Okay? That He wants to give Himself to us. Himself. Three things the church needs to know. The hope of our calling, the glorious riches of his inheritance. And there's something else. What is that? Thank you, MJ. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand, in the heavenly places. Folks, this is what God wants us to know. This is what He wants us to know. He wants to know, He wants us to know His exceeding, the exceeding greatness of His power. Now that word power, we throw it around in the church. It comes from the word dunamis, which is where we get the word dynamite, and yes, that means power. And you know, when you see a dynamite blow up, you know, it's, that's powerful. But here's another shade of its meaning, and it really often depends. It doesn't always have to be translated as power. It simply means his ability. I've come to like that word, that his ability. Paul is telling the church, I'm praying for you that your eyes would be enlightened with understanding, that you would have understanding and the knowledge of him, wisdom, to know what is the exceeding greatness of His ability towards us who believe. In other words, God has promised to do something in us, and we may go to church on Sabbath, and we may come home, and we go to work on Tuesday, and we have the most miserable day of our experience on Tuesday. The boss was mean to us, the dog bit my pant leg, and the, uh, you know, the car broke down in the middle of the freeway, and I blocked up traffic on 84, for hours on end. And on top of that, I went home to bake a loaf of bread and I forgot to put the salt in it and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and then I kicked the cat just before going to bed. And I just feel like nobody loves me. God doesn't love me. Nobody could love me. And what Paul wants us to know is God has the ability to redeem us in spite of our miserable, wretched selves that we are. Does that make sense? That in spite of our worst days on planet Earth, Paul is saying, I want you to know. I want you to know Him, to know what, that He has the ability to do in us who believe according, according to what? In comparison to what? He says, in accordance with the mighty power which worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Now this is amazing. You gotta stop and think about this. 
because there's these resurrection stories in the Bible. And in the Bible, we have these stories where Elisha resurrected uh, the Shunammite woman's son. And then there was another case where Elisha was dead. And they took the body of this individual and just tossed him in the grave and his he happened to rub up against the bones of Elisha and he came back to life. And then, of course, Jesus raised people from the dead. He raised the little girl, 12-year-old girl. He raised uh, the widow of Nain. Her son was dead. They were having the funeral procession. He stopped the funeral procession. Can you imagine somebody doing that today? You see a hearse going by and all the cars going by. Can you imagine somebody just saying, Stop the traffic. Stop the traffic. The funeral director gets out of the car and the preacher gets out of the car. What's going on? And this man says, Open the door of that hearse. And they open the door of that hearse and they pull out the casket. And Jesus says, Rise up, son. And a person comes back to life right there in the middle of, of the traffic. Can you imagine something like that? But that's essentially what was going on here. All these resurrection stories, we have to put ourselves in the shoes of these individuals and what was going on in their experience. But notice what it says, the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. In all of these resurrection stories, somebody else went to that deceased person and said, rise up. And that person rose up. But with Christ, the Word of God within him resurrected him. Yes, the angel came and said, Jesus, come forth. Your Father calls you. Okay? But it was the power of God that raised up all of these individuals, including Jesus. And that same resurrection power, Paul is saying, I want the church to know it, to experience it. Okay? Because we often go through life and we muddle through life, and we this is, was my thinking. I don't know if it ever crossed your mind, but it was my thinking growing up. I grew up in the church. I was raised in the church, not as an Adventist, but I went to church every week, sometimes twice a week. Okay? But when I read my Bible or when I heard the Bible read at the services, my biggest question was this, where is the power of God today? Because I'd heard about these stories of you know, God parting the Red Seas. I'd heard these stories of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. I'd heard of these stories of Jesus multiplying loaves and fishes and feeding thousands upon thousands of people. But where was the power today? That was my question as I came out of the confessional. How do I overcome? How do I overcome? I need power to overcome. See? You can't overcome sin on your own. This is what Paul is talking about. If we understood just a fraction, if we understood, just had an inkling of this power that God offers us through Christ, our faith experience would be different. Life transformed. Life transformed. What is the exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe according to the working of His mighty power which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places? The text goes on, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Paul wants us to know three things. He wants the church to know what is the hope of our calling, what is the exceeding riches of his glory, and what is the, the greatness of God's power. Because if the church doesn't understand that, we're just playing church. We're, we're just, you know, 
occupying some time, getting together, singing a few hymns. Okay? But if we understand these three things, it's a different world. It's a different world. Now, it's quiz time. Okay? Quiz time. First answer is right on the board. All right? What are we to know? What are the three things we're to know? The hope of his calling. Do you know the hope that God has given you by calling you? Okay? The hope of his calling. Number two, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. We have no idea what God has for us. We have no idea. But it's going to be wonderful. And it starts today. It doesn't start, you know, once we get there. It starts right here and right now. Your inheritance begins today. Okay? And number three, the exceeding greatness of his power. Not just the greatness of it, not just his power. And not just the greatness of his power, but the exceeding greatness of his power towards us. Okay? God is in the business of changing lives. He has the power. If you yield your will to him, he will change you. He will take a sinner and make them into a saint. Isn't that good news? You're not convinced. I've been up here for 20 minutes. You're not convinced. Maybe I should start all over again. I don't know. God can make a sinner into a saint. Right? Three things the church needs to know. It's my prayer that we would know and understand this. And we would see this in the days and the weeks to come in our own lives, in the lives of the church, that we would pray for these same eyes to be open for ourselves, that we would understand this. Is that, a, is that a reasonable prayer? I think that's a reasonable prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, your word is able to speak to us. It's not just a letter on a page. It has living power. There is hope that comes from your word. It's my prayer that the blessing and the power of your Holy Spirit would be with us to understand these three main points, the hope of our calling, the riches of our inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of your power towards us who believe. Father, it's my prayer that we would place our trust in you and that you would begin that good work in us that you have started and that you have promised to finish. Please forgive us for our failings, our shortcomings, our rebellion against you. And I pray that you would transform every heart that is listening to this message. We thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering this prayer. And we pray it. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen.